Welcome, Chris Frenchy Smith. Thanks for having me, Johnny. It's nice to meet you. Chris has produced records for, and you will notice by the Trail of Dead, The Toadies, Fastball, Jet, Greg Raleigh, Wild Child, Austin Music Foundation Artist Development Program graduate, Jane Ellen Bryant, and countless more. It's hard to remember the past, just because every day is the only thing that I'm really thinking about. Yeah. So um, I don't even know who that person is that you just spoke about, because all I really have is being with you and, uh, and the fact that I'm updating some mixes as soon as I finish this. <laughs> and what? I don't want to be late for that session. Who are you updating mixes for? Who are you currently working on? I'm, uh, I'm working for, um, I don't know if you know this, but I collect dudes. Yeah, you know it's a part yeah, of dude. my thing. It's like I just got a lot of dudes, and um, it's a some people that I reconnected with in the afterlife of the '90s, and they're okay. called War Daddies. So we're okay. just updating their mixes, and they go to master tomorrow. So that magical. What if we try some things? Excellent. I'm always going to vote for more psychedelic effects, but you know I don't know if that's their thing. Okay, hmm. um, Frenchie. You come from Durant, Oklahoma? I did. I grew up in a smaller city in, in um, southern Oklahoma. Obviously, by my age, pre-internet age, and, yeah. um, <laughs> which, is a, which is a good point of reference. Yeah. Um, when you see a seven-year-old with an iPhone, uh, it, it's good to sort of remember the past a little bit. Remember the old days. But you started out in a band called 16 Deluxe. That, that, was a, that was a band that we were, I think we were really, we were really that in a moment in time, you know, without me being so bold. We were kind of like that Austin band yeah. in, in many ways. Um, and, um, and we certainly could have benefited from organizations like Austin Music Foundation where we could come in and ask questions like, we just had to be so cool. We were scared to ask questions. Yeah. And I'm not scared to ask questions anymore because I'm just trying to figure out everything myself daily. You know, I'm just glad to belong and to participate and to be kind of like the rock and roll uncle coach for all these creative forces, you know, the musicians out there. I, I, I see you being so brave and, uh, and just having the most awesome fuck it attitude like I exist and I'm doing this and those are the people that really stimulate and define who I am and so when I see that in people I'm like yeah I'm with them and yeah. so I'm, I'm kind of the vampire of cool if you're cool I side up with you and help you record so my cool is based on other people's cool well you know cool yeah, but, but seriously you know, I think record producers should really get, get our, you know as a workforce we need to get our attitude in check we're the helper. But let's go to Star Wars for a second. Women love Han Solo. He's he's yes. he's he's just he's kind of um he's a scruffy looking nerf herder. He's a scoundrel. <laughs> a rock and roll producer, if you're doing a good job, you're kinda like C three PO. You know what I mean? <laughs> so if the spaceship's gonna blow up, all you can do is make commentary on it. <laughs> yeah. But try to try to help and uh Tone down the ego, and and be be a supportive person. You know, be be an active. Act, really respect the role that this amazing music has come to you. This amazing artist has come to you. Make make it mean something. Yeah. Do you remember what it was where you uh, where you transformed from being uh, just a rock and roll guitarist and songwriter? into being a producer of other bands? Like, you started the bubble when you still were in 16 Deluxe, right? That's, cor that's correct. Yeah. I, I, I think I... This is a funny share. Uh, I think I was producing records the second I got a record player. You know, when, you, when you're a child and you have toys and you maybe get different toys to form a band and you're, like, locking the door so no one can see you. So I was... Uh, uh, Obi Wan Kenobi and Dracula, they you know they 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 did they they were my band doing uh, Joan Jett I love rock and roll in my bedroom you know this is, I'm airing this for the first time now so but I, I think mentally I was seeing that um, 
that these records didn't come out of the sky as, as a child. I, I, I understood that there was a vocal sound, even as a child in the 70s, like a, an Eagles record, where it had a, a reverb on it, which right. adds an ambience. And then I would try to get my voice to have reverb on it, just standing in the shower. I'm like, oh, that's close. Right. So, um, but by the mid 90s, um, my love for music was not solely satisfied by only playing in a band, um, which was really important to me. Um, but I, I, I needed to, to believe in other people to believe in myself, and so that I called that record production. Okay. And then you started the bubble and didn't look back. What he said, yeah, yes. Exactly. So. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about, you've been in this business for a long time, you've been making music for a long time. Um, we were talking about some of the changes that have come about, both good and bad, between the, like, for the artists, mm -hmm. and, and what has changed for them? What have you noticed is the biggest change? I, I think it's, you know, really, you know, I have so much respect for, for artists or what you're subject to right now. You, you, you have to create great music and you have to edit your your ideas to and be really self-aware of course where does music come from lack of self-awareness so that's power <laughs> dumb luck works well but then at some point you have to kind of pull back and go you know what these songs or these ideas or this way of presenting what i what i am or what's special about me those kinds of questions but those are not my best foot forward. Maybe steer closer to this direction. But then you also, you have to be kind of a branding genius. And um, you don't have the luxury of um, checking out for a couple of days and missing a few emails. You know, you, you, you know the, you, your mindset, this is, right. this is new history, but your mindset the, the, in the world of music, it's, at all times, uh, does anyone agree with this, or am I on my on my own? A, a creative person's mindset—it's always, especially in music, in the music world, music industry—it's always Saturday night at midnight mentally, and equally <laughs> 8 a.m. Manhattan yeah. time is money. <laughs> right, right. So, right. Um, so we live in a duality of. And like, oh my God, are we getting stuff done? What kind of advice do you give artists that come in and are bogged down with maybe the outside aspects of creativity, the things that are coming, like social media and things like that, that take you away from actual creating, what you're supposed to be creating? Just, you know, however you we present ourselves in, in social media, is are you are you talking about the thing in a way that they're, you're still keeping it, it you know, you, the, there, was, there, was some, there was an epic cool about every poster of a band I had in my bedroom as a kid. Just my entire room was like rock, 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 rock. I mean, screw school, you know, and just all, all I cared about was music. Nothing has changed. And so whatever kind of posts are being made, you know, you're letting your audience see you behind the scenes, don't cock block yourself from still going up on that, uh, someone's poster, you know what I mean? Don't, don't go on, you know what I mean? Like right. Keep that, keep that, it's not, it's not cooler than you, but just keep that imagination, um, that superhero thing alive. Um, I've seen social media posts just... Um, Overly humanizing artists? Well, they're too honest, yeah. you know, because being in a band or you know, making records. We're kind of geeks. Like, people don't really need to know this. Right, right, right. You know? <laughs> okay. Uh, Laugh, struck a will. nerve there. Yeah. But, you know, just the hours of working on a song. Yeah. And you record it on your iPhone. You send it to your friend. And we use technology. We, we go to events. We talk about our feelings. I mean, it's... <laughs> to, to do anything, actually, in music. If you haven't 
had multiple people in your life warn you that you're getting really weird, you're probably not any good. That's true. Like, you know, Johnny, in fact, I'm glad you're here because I've been meaning to talk to you. <laughs> what Am are you going to do when you fucking grow up? You know I don't what I mean? Because oh, yeah, yeah. you're so I no fucked. <laughs> I love you for it. Yes. We can always move in together, you know what I mean? We could. Like, just give it a few years. Yeah, it's I an like odd you. couple. Okay. Um, <laughs> let me ask you a question about music community. When you first, you and I met when we first moved to Austin in the early 90s. We both worked at Whole Foods. Mm -hmm. and you Last job I had. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you worked, uh, you had a band called Glaze. I did. We, we haven't made it to the internet until today. Oh yeah. yeah, I think that was that was it. And there's yeah. an Austin band now called Glaze. Oh, there is. I wrote them. I was like, I like that name. <laughs> I thought you were like because cease and desist. No, I've never, never. Mm -hmm. I, they're actually really good. So uh, throughout that and throughout uh, 16 Deluxe, did you uh, what the sense of community of the Austin scene, which you were a part of? We have a lot of friends. We kind of came up together. We're kind of there for each other. What did that do for you personally and artistically, being a part of the community? Yeah, it's it being a part of the community. It it um. And you're talking about we're gonna the music you, scene, like like early '90s. You want to go that far back? Uh, yeah, and okay. what it's done for you this whole time. I think being a part of the community is like early on. If, if you have a certain amount of skills and a certain amount of delusion and arrogance that, right, we think what we're doing is awesome, being a part of the community socially, being around musicians that have accomplished things that I would have dreamed of accomplishing and maybe not really thought I was in the, meant to be in the club, just seeing how they hang and how they talk amongst each other. Yeah. And um, am I being a bit needy when I... You know, hey, uh, I'm trying to figure out how to be cool and not chase this cool thing that I'm trying to get through my fingers. You know, sli have it slip through my fingers. So right. I'm just having uh, even even working at Whole Foods like we both did, and and knowing other musicians like you or Brian Beatty from Glass Eye, right. uh, working with Cindy Toth from the Reavers. Yeah. These were people that were just really, you know, they've already toured the world, they've made records, yeah. and they just knew a ton about how it all looked. And so um, being able to identify with those types of mentors, even though I didn't know that I was asking them to be a mentor, right, right. they were just, somehow I could appeal to them on a human level and not need a restraining order to ask them questions. You right, know? Like, right. like I didn't bug them out too much. Right. No, um, but it, as far as, I mean, what, what you're doing here tonight or today, this morning, what day is this? Sunday. <laughs> Just being together. I think as much as, as much as we're really propelled to tell our story and, and uh, put it all out online, really finding each other. And um, there's, such, there's such strength in numbers. And it's, it's something that, um, you know, Geffen Records can't give to you, Universal Records, Warner Music Group. Um, N no one can really understand another musician like another musician. So, of course, we're 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 competitive. We're into our own our own shit, you know. But it's never it's it, it's we're not jocks. We escape the tyranny of jocks to be creative uh, people. So the more you identify with, you know, your brothers and sisters in the in the creative sector. That goes a long way. No one really understands us like us. So, um, you know, look around you and as many as many business cards as you can get. That maybe you will see a booking agent here, or maybe there's a record producer here. You know, we're we're kind of secondary, uh, but, but look around you at each other and identify who who are some of the cool creative people that you like. Maybe you've seen, there's a music musician here that you've wanted to play a show with. Well, just try not to scare them when you give them your phone number. You know? <laughs> um, well, it's I, our part of it. There is strength in numbers, and being part of a community, I think, is one of the more unique things about the Austin music scene. And I think back at a time when, uh, 
when Paul Miner used to have the Sunday rock and roll free for all at the hole in the wall where no one was getting paid for anything. We were all just showing up and basically working out almost like comics on a weeknight, working out our new stuff mm -hmm. in front of each other to see what the reaction is from our friends and from our community, from our scene. And, and really the win of that was no matter what happened all week, at least on Sunday night. Yeah, we had we, that thing. <laughs> we'd meet each other at our plateau, our rut, or right. our peak. Yeah, or yeah, whatever yeah. happened, like, okay, well, I might sing a Freddie Fender song at, at two in the morning. Yeah. I, I, I can at least have that sustain me and start my next week. Yeah. I do have to cut this off short for a second. Okay. That's my lovely lady, Victoria. Hi, Victoria. And that little bundle of joy oh. right there is is our child, Claire. And oh. um, I, I just got really distracted. Oh. <laughs> Congratulations, Frenchie. Uh, he's a dad. And uh, she's going to speak next. OK. Uh, she's um, got a lot to say. Well, speaking of audience <laughs> members that would like to speak, does anyone have any questions for Frenchie? Yes, sir. Can you come up here and kind of speak yeah, up come, a little bit? Come on up because come on up I'm and speak blind up and maybe it won't hear you. Yeah. Or just come up a little closer oh, where yeah. we can hear you. What, what is your favorite Christmas album of all time and why? What is your favorite Christmas album of all time and why? <laughs> so it's an, a full album. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it's cliche, but I mean, really, the Vince Guaraldi, you know, the Peanuts. It just, it uh, just yeah. takes me to the special place. Like, it just screams togetherness. And, yeah. And, and the fact there's, you know, there's a little bit of classical musical element to it, and Vince Guaraldi's um, uh, a war vet, and um, it was kind of late in his career, and he kind of was a hip cat, right, with a chapeau yeah. and, you know, smoky pipe, leather leather patches. And he had, his cool had come and gone. And uh, he was asked to come up with the, I think the theme song, Lucy Loves Linus, or whatever the actual theme song is called. And he took that thing, like, I got you. And um, and, and it's, just, it's just amazing, you know, it's the, it's, there's such believable recordings, and you feel like those humans are in the room with you. Yeah. I, I, that never gets old, but I think, um, I think, but if if you were to ask it in another old school way, album a record, record, um, Christmas song. Um, ooh, it's a tough one, isn't it? But you know, the, it's it is it it is a wham song. Last Christmas, yeah, yeah. No <laughs> it is it is a wham song. Last yeah, Christmas, it's not George Michael, <laughs> but it was wham. That one's really hot. You yeah, know, it's just a really good song. Great vocal performance too. Anyone else? Any questions for Frenchie? Uh, yes, sir. Go ahead. Do you produce music electronically? Okay. Um, it really, my history has been that humans come into the studio and there might be like 24 to 30 inputs and they do it live. So I'm kind of old school. Um, but, um, but sometimes it, it, has, it is more relevant to kind of work out with, start out with an electronic beat and work more one on one and maybe like a Depeche Mode would have looked at creating a track, but um, I'm kind of like a caveman, you know. I, I actually mic things and use knobs. And and you you're in a you represent an amazing part of um, recorded music history. You know, you could you could take samples and and really start a great groove and have some kind of melody. Or just chordal structure, just tracking d direct. What if whatever instrument you have, or or virtual instruments, can sound amazing? But at this point, I'm I I am not an elitist about where it's recorded. In fact, I'm infatuated with it. The recording studio is in your mind. So Abbey Road is in your mind. So you can. There's no rules. If you got a 
hot track and you made it at your house. Uh, good on you, man. Yeah. We have a couple more questions. Yes, ma'am. Sorry. Okay. I think my my only no is um, too many tom toms, <laughs> and um, and, um, and and I'll let me let me justify that. And uh, of course, I'm picking on drummers. I play guitar. Typically, drummers, guitar players, we're on different teams, but I'm actually on everybody's team. But when there's like an unusually large amount of tom toms. That particular drummer, how whatever I'm inheriting that day, is thinking about those tom toms more than just the general pocket of the song. Yeah. That's my fear, and I'm I'm ready to move past that fear. Maybe I recreate that self fulfilling prophecy by holding drummers in a negative place. <laughs> But if there's too many Tom Toms, it makes me wonder if they've actually know the song. If um, you have a session coming up at the bubble and you're a drummer, you might want to think about leaving some of those Tom Toms at home. Well, let's let's let, let's look at the composition of them and like do something really cool instead of like, well, I'm lost. <laughs> I'm lost. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's a good place to stop. This is my dear friend Chris Frenchy. I don't. I don't think I finished. Oh, question. sorry. You want to finish? She sorry. was. She was brave. She okay. asked a question. And what? What do I love? Oh, sorry. What do you love? This is a real share. I love when I s ask an artist to do something, and they're like, "You got it," and they miss understood what I asked them to do and what they did was so much better than what I, it, I, what I was even trying to get them to do. And um, th I love when that happens. Yeah. I also love when I have an idea and um, I'm very human in this moment and the band nails my idea and it was really bad and I'm just brave enough to go, <laughs> Thank you, um, ladies and gentlemen, for trying that idea, but um, I couldn't have been more wrong. Let's <laughs> keep doing what you were hearing. Thanks for that. Uh, tacos on me, you know. But, um, you know it's, but the recording process is fluid and being rigid. And I mean, just, um, I, I do not have the right to be rigid. I need to be that person that's just, not just on paper is cool, but I can just roll with the stuff. But, but definitely of the things I, you could see in a recording studio. I have definitely seen them. And uh, yeah, like when Snake, who's Lemmy's assistant, passed out. And, um, you know, and then Lemmy gave him a nice kick in the ribs, and then he woke up. <laughs> but that was, that was like a Tuesday. You know, just anything yeah. kind of goes, you know. As long as everybody makes it home alive, you know. Yeah. It's all fair in rock and roll. But, um, you know, back to what we were talking about, because yeah. I, I do feel selfish about talking about how great I am right now. All of you that are in here, you're doing something individually that got you to come here. So just kind of look around and see other players in the room and connect. And, uh, and whether it's places like this or like, or like a radio coffee, where we love going there. Um, but just find, find places where you could just you know, be intermingled with each other, that's not a loud bar, you know, just, and, uh, because really no one understands where you're coming from like you, you do, and um, having that, 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 that brotherhood and sisterhood, when in doubt, that, that's the one thing that's, it's kind of, it's greater than money, it's greater than who your manager is, who your producer is, your agent, your label, and um, no one can really take that away from you, so that's it. All right. Chris Frenchy Smith, everyone. Thank you so much. No, you have to come out. Thank you so much.